Hello, everybody. We're here today just want to have a conversation and just awaken the world today, those in Christ and in life. I got Justin Wiseman here today. You know, he's a director of New Directions Ministry where he facilitates, you know, people who goes into prison and what facility they go to and, you know, numbers, numerous of other things as well. And, you know, he stepped in some big shoes, you know, because a lot of people may know Lynn Hill, you know, he passed away. You know, they said to be um, absent with the body, present with the Lord. And so Justin just fit right in. You know, he is handling it well, and I commend him for that. So with that being said, I want to introduce Justin. Hey, buddy. Thank you, Darnell. It's a pleasure to be here. So, yeah, I'm with New Directions, and... Our mission is to change lives, change futures with Jesus. We are all about Jesus. Len was an amazing man, and he went to be with the Lord. Um, he was a humble man. He was the most humble man I know personally, and uh, he did amazing things with New Direction. So our, we're going to correctional facilities, and we're all about Jesus, and our main focus is around Lansing. So we got 10 correctional facilities around Lansing, and we're just going in there sharing the gospel, revealing Jesus, sharing God's love, and we do that continually. And we're just always looking for opportunities to do that. And then from there, my heart is to help them when they come back to the Lansing area, to walk alongside them, because we know tribulations and trials will come. And so it's my heart to walk with them so they don't get veered off course and kind of keep to the word and have that foundation, have the fruits of the Spirit manifesting in their lives. And so that's kind of the core of what New Direction does. We go into correction facilities, we share the love of God, and then we want to help them when they come back to the community. So basically, you saying... We go in there to uh, mentally and spiritually prepare them to uh, come back to society. Yes, very much so. So, you know, it takes a while to change on the exterior, but first we want to change their interior and then change the way they think. So they're thinking not from the flesh, but thinking from the spirit. And that takes time. It's a process. Um, but that's the goal is to continually do that with them. Uh, we're not judgment. We're not celebrating maybe the things that got them there, but we're celebrating about what God has done for them. And we're revealing that to them, what God has done for them. But they're a child of God, highly favored, deeply loved. And it's continually processed, you know, because they lived one way, they didn't hear about it, and now we want to direct that and change their thoughts. And that's what somebody did for me, and so it's my heart to do that for other people. Um, God works through everybody, and um, no one is too far from God, you know. We see that throughout the Bible. Yeah, my thing is it when, when you were speaking, it kind of brings me back to when we was in elementary school. You know, they used to have on our report card the excessive talking or needs to pay attention or um, what's the main one they used to say? Make effective use of class time. So basically that's what I, you know, like to get the message conveyed to the uh, the, the prisoners or the inmates is to, you know, make effective use of class time right now. Get your mind right because whatever got you in here awaits you when you get out. And so they, what they say, the recidivism, I think I said that right, rate yeah. is very high. But when you have people who really come to grips that their mindset and their thinking is off, that's when you see the total change mentally. And once you change mentally, you can grasp things spiritually. Yeah. You ever heard the saying, you, you believe right, you live right? And so they're in that position, so they need to humble themselves and acknowledge why they're there and then um, kind of take that time and use that time. Perseverance, you know, we have, what is it? Perseverance produces character, character, hope. And so they have to persevere. And in that time of perseverance, they're going to build their character. And character is overcoming whatever is coming against them. Overcoming, um, what would it be? It would be... Um, their belief of who they are and changing who they are into what God says they are. And so in that process, while they're in the facility, to really do that. And if they do that, they're going to be better when they come out. Because the reality is the correction facility is kind of flawed in getting people that help that they need. And so it's a blessing to be able to do that. Now, obviously, mine is all centered on Christ. I've heard that you could be in prison, don't quote me on this, for like, we'll say five, ten years, whatever it is. But they don't actually start the rehabilitation process until like a year and a half before you get released. Um, it's not mandatory. So the rest of the time in there, you have a choice. Um, are you going to grow and become a different person? And um, or are you going to stay the same? And so my heart is that they're going to grow and become more like Christ. 
And Jesus says, I came to give you life and life abundantly. It's not the American dream, but it's this peace and this joy that you have, even in the correctional facility, in the prison, or even in a little tiny house or whatever situation you might find yourself in. Um, you can still have peace. You can still have joy. I had it when I had nothing, and I have it now. So the circumstances around me doesn't change because I have Christ. You know, I think of, um, what was it, Joseph? He was sold as a slave. He was naked, but he still had he still was a prosperous man. So the world would say, he's not prosperous. But he had Christ, so he was prosperous. And then you see that manifest throughout his life. And so to encourage them who they are in Christ is really my desire and to build them up in that. And it's a process, like I say, um, but it's a process that's worth it. Yeah, you, you said something that really enlightened me. You said what God said. And that's the very thing a lot of people are unaware of, of what the word of God. You know, because it's like when you know the word of God, it would just um, take you in direction that you never thought you would go. If you're willing to go and humble yourself, because it's like when God really uh, chooses you to be his vessel, he's going to take you in ways that you never thought you would go. And it's like, wow, this new way of thinking is is unknown to me as well as others. So it's like you really have to be in a position and in a mindset. To not only know what God says, but to follow what God says. Yep. And then once you follow what God says, it says to know the love of God that surpasses knowledge. You know it because you experience it. Now it's an experiential knowledge. So we get into the word of God, we grow in the word of God, and now we're walking it out. You know, faith without works is dead. So now we're walking out, we're beginning to know experiential, this love of God that he has for me. That, hey, if he calls me in this direction, he's really going to work these things out. Does it mean it's going to be easy? No. But we know that God is going to work through this situation. We're going to know the love of God that he has for us. And so as you continually build upon those, it becomes easier to continually work. Um, but you always got to stay in the word. That's the most important. I've heard it said about um, how can you live in sin and love God? And it was somebody said, well, because you don't love the word of God. But if you love the word of God, then you really can't love sin. It's going to change you from the inside out. You know, it's alive and active. And so it's going to change your nature and who you are if you love the Word of God and spend time in it. It's not that we're perfect, but we're growing and becoming more like Christ as we spend time in the Word. And that's the key word, growing. Yeah. You know, like the Bible says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, but when I became a man, I put such childlike things away. And then I was just thinking about stuff. When I was a kid, I was mad at my grandmother because they stayed in the, in the suburbs of um, Grand Ledge. It, it really wasn't many houses back then the way it is now. And this was like 1975. So they had some kids, me and my cousin's age, that was, they had everything. They had ATVs and mini bikes and they had the, the rim that crank up and down. So we was able to dunk when we was like five or six years old. And so my grandmother would say, y'all come from over there. Don't be sitting in them people face all day. And so we would be mad like, dang, we can't have no fun. They got everything over there. So it wasn't until I was like, Shoot, maybe, uh, I would say up in age, probably in my 40s, that, you know, once I start reading the word, and I think it's in Ecclesiastic, if, if I'm not mistaken, the Proverbs, it says, very seldom set foot in your neighbor's uh, yard, I mean, house. Something and like so, <laughs> it's like, here I was mad at my grandmother for following the word. And so, it's like, the word, it really, it gives you a better understanding and insight mm -hmm. on how... You should do things. Like the Bible said, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light. And so it's like the way, show you the way to go, the truth, show you what to and what not to do in the life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're the sheep. He's the shepherd. And we just get to follow him. So if we follow him, you know, we're going to see protection. We're going to see good things manifest. Um, but it really comes back to that peace and that joy. See, I was the kid growing up with all the toys and everything. Um, so I was very fortunate, but what my dad didn't have was Jesus. So he chased everything else in his life. And um, all that stuff in the end is meaningless if you don't have Christ. So I've had the privilege of seeing the abundant life and then coming down to when my dad passed, he had very little in his life. But all the stuff in the end is meaningless if you don't have Christ. And so, you know, people will chase after money. And I know money is not the answer. Um, Christ is the answer. And so it's going in these correction facilities and sharing Christ with them. Um, I've never had a ton, but I've lived with a ton and I've lived with little. 
those are irrelevant when you have Christ, really, um, because it's that peace and that joy that really um, keeps me going and excited about tomorrow. And so that's where I woke up this morning thinking about um, faith, hope, and love, and just the value of those three things in our lives. Wow, that's, that's deep, because when you, when you said that, it just brought to my attention that scripture, my remembrance, that scripture says we should always have a hope of the reason why we serve God, you know. And I was like, wow. I think I said I kind of probably chopped that up a little. It says we should always have a... Oh, I can't think of it right can't. Now. But it was something like that, yeah. though. Yeah. You know, reason for the hope that we have in yeah. Christ. Yeah. I knew it would come to mind. And so when you think about that, it's like, first of all, you have to have, have had made a conscious decision to put a, a level of trust in God yep. in order to have that hope. And then when people see you, regardless of what's going on around you, that you still trust in, in God and his holy word, yep. that's hope. Yep. And so I think of first, you know, it's the love of God is what, it's the, it's the goodness of God or the love of God that brings us to repentance. So I'm always sharing the love of God that even though while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So if Christ died for me while I was a sinner, you know, how much does he love me now as a child of his? You know, connected with him. I am like, you know, my picture is on his mantle. You know, he's thinking of me. He loves me. He cares for me. So that love is so important is to grasp that love. And maybe we don't all experience that love growing up from our family in those environments. And I think of that in the correctional facilities. So really it takes time to press into that, to know the love of God. Um, that even while we were still sinner, God loved us and sent his son to die for us. And then from there, we have this hope. Um, and hope and faith kind of work together so close, synonymously. Um, I think of hope is, so anytime you think of imagination in the Bible, it's as in a bad, like a vain imagination. It's seen as a negative. And what about if we think of hope as a positive imagination? So hope is, you know, we have a positive imagination of something in our lives for what God says for these things. So we have this hope, and then from there we have this faith. We have faith in what God says. We have faith in what God has accomplished for this. And so now faith without works is dead. So we have a hope. We have a vision of what God says about us. Now we're using our faith that's coming with action, and we're doing these things. Um, and God's working in us, through us, around us. Because it's always centered on Christ. It's not Justin's will. Justin's way. I'm talking about God's way. And Jesus says, I came to give you life and life more abundantly. So we follow him. He's the shepherd. We're the sheep. And we're going to continually walk in that. So the love of God, and then we're giving ourselves hope in what God has called us to do. And now we're walking it out in faith, one step at a time. Um, doesn't make, this is one step at a time too. You know, we don't have 10 steps out there. It's just one step at a time. And we have to remember that because um, so often we want to see the whole picture and we don't get to see that. Yeah, because I think people get confused with you know, the 12-step program and being in Christ. It's like, that's a total different process. Because it's like, when you come to Christ, it's like, there's not no six-week program or I'm going to be doing this by this time. Like, you never know what you're going to do. I've been in Christ 20 years and still working on things that, you know, I may have struggled with back when I was in the streets. It's continually real relationship, you know. That's why I'm strong in that discipleship, encouraging people when they come out one day at a time, walking with them. And that's something just like you never quit getting in the word and you should really never quit having people around you that are like-minded because those people that are like-minded with you, centered on Christ is what's really going to give you the ability to see the things you want to see in your life, to change cultures and people. Um, we want to be around everybody, but we want to make sure we have people like you in your corner to cheer you on and encourage you. Um, with the word of God and what God calls you to. And that's one thing about, you know, going inside the prisons, you really have to be well versed in the word because they, you come in there and in one or two scriptures, they're going to eat you alive. Like, because they don't have nothing but time to, you know, read the word and stuff like that. So it's like, you say something wrong, they're going to be right there. Ah, ah, it says this. And so I've heard of people telling me that stories like that too. They use the verse out of context and they're like, I don't think that's actually accurate. So, um, and that's awesome. I love to see men just with the desire and that I can preach. And then I get done preaching. And I have a guy come up with me. 
and give me like three verses to go off of what I preached on too. So that's a cool, and it's a blessing um, to go in there. And sometimes I think, what am I doing here? These people have so much knowledge in the word, but it's also our presence just being in there to show the love of God to them and encourage them. And, you know, they don't want to hear the same person all the time, so it's good to go in there to have someone from the outside come in and share the word. Um, but it's awesome to see guys in there with so much knowledge in the word. And then it's just helping them to live that out and to really, you know, make sure that they understand what they're reading, maybe in the totality of the Bible. And two, you know, they love to see what you got on, what kind of shoes, and what you know. But I remember walking through the yard one day and one of the guys hollered, he looked like us. Because I had a, uh, just a leather jacket on, some Levi's and some Air Maxes and a fitted hat. So it was like, I mean, who was that dude? Mm-hmm. And so that's, and then once you start talking, and they realize, like, wow, this brother has really changed. So, And then, too, I had to look at uh, one of the guys told me, you let me know it was fine to have swag and still be in Christ. Because they had a set way of thinking with, you, I had to come in there with a suit on and a Bible tucked up under my arm and an overcoat, you know, and some, some galoshes, you know, the things that come to Things to cover up your shoes and uh-huh. stuff like that. But it's like, I think those are glasses, right? I don't know. That's uh, beyond me. I'm not that fancy, but I, I get what you're saying. Yeah. things to go over your dress shoes. Yeah. But, so it's like, that's what Jesus is awakening the people. If it's all about your heart, heart posture yeah. versus what you have on. And so it's like, you could be the sharpest dressed person in the world. But if you don't have a change of heart and a change of way and a change of thinking, what what Paul say? You count that as dumb. Yeah, that's of no value in the big picture of things. What you dress like or look like. It's about that relationship that you have with the Creator, um, which is kind of a struggle, you know, when people do judge and stuff. You know, Christians judge. I think they just need to grasp the love of God. Get back to the basics of God is love. Don't judge. You know, He is not judging you. You don't judge others. Really, we're just here to encourage. I mean, isn't there a verse talking about? As long as it is today, encourage one another. And it's always today. So we should always be an encourage one another. Not to sin, but to live free from sin. That God is for you. And um, that he is He is for you. And um, that's tremendous. And so I, that's just the basic of my desires. To continually encourage people to seek first the kingdom of God. His righteousness. And not even, I know this might, you know, not even my righteousness. I see God's righteousness. What does God say? How is he righteous? And the more I do that, I become an act like he acts. Um, but it's a process. It's not, you know, I've been a Christian for over 20 years. And uh, it's a growth process to where I am now. And I still got much growing to do. But if I quit reading the word today and quit doing all these things, talking with God, I would, you know, you're either going forward or you're going backwards. And so you always got to be moving forward in the direction that you want to go. And so... That's what they get to do while they're in the correctional facilities is continually press forward, preparing themselves for when they get out. And um, hopefully they connect with the right people to see success, um, which success is peace and joy and hope in their lives. Love. <laughs> love, yeah. Yeah, that's one thing. I mean, if you really look at love, it's like you can't really define that because it, it just goes up, 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 and beyond, up, up, up and beyond in a way. Because I was just thinking about a lot of people really don't know what love is. True. A lot of people have been abused and um, administered dysfunction and many other generational curses as a way of life. And so if you're not really coming at them harshly and um, making them feel belittled, they don't feel loved. Mm-hmm. And so when somebody comes, it's like, hey, Look, you know, like you, you, you yeah. see a a dog or something, you don't know how to approach it. Like, hey, buddy, you know, yeah. like making them think that you know you're all right. Mm-hmm. And two, I used to work with um, kids. They had, uh, I, I don't know what to say now, because I mean, you, you got to be politically correct when you say things now. But it's like the kids they they were deaf and mute, mm-hmm. so they don't know how to communicate with you. So they would come up to you and just touch your face and feel your vibe. To see, first of all, they got to know that you are right in order to approach you and, and touch you in that manner. And so when they do, it's like they, they get a, a, a sigh of relief. 
because they see you coming in there all boisterous and you know belligerent they're gonna back up like whoa and you can just see it in their eyes you know like they become like a, a level of um, frightening yeah so that's why it's just so important like you said don't judge and just approach people and meet people where they are yeah. versus where you think they should be i was listening to um somebody has said that scripture um Train up a child in the way he should go, not in the way that you want him to go or what you think they should do or who you think they should be. That's a major um, place of error. This is true. This is true. That caused conflicts in a lot of lives. I think it's very important to, yeah, to share the word, encourage them in the word, and point them in the word, and then as they direct their lives to what? God does that. Because I say, delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. He's not going to give you the new car, but he's going to give these desires. Like, my illustration is, I do prison ministry. I didn't give my life to Christ to do prison ministry. But God gave me that desire from this new person that I am in Christ to do prison ministry. So I delight myself in the Lord. He gives me these desires, and then I go after them. So, um that's what I would train my child to do. Delight yourself in the Lord. Spend time with the Lord. And then whatever those desires are, go after them. It might not be what I would do, but go after them. And um, if you make a mistake, redirect. I've done that many times in my own life where I made a mistake. I could tell, like, you know, this was not God. It wasn't God's fault. It was my fault. I went the wrong direction. So then I re redirect and go in the direction that God had for me. Um, and then so real quick, the illustration is, I work for the Red Cross part-time, and I do prison ministry. I'm the only part-time employee at the Red Cross in this particular area in my position. And I didn't think they would give me a part-time job. So I went off trying to do something else to meet my financial needs so that I could do. I, there was good intentions there. But when I went off in this other direction, I found out that it wasn't godly. It wasn't a godly direction. There was untruthfulness in it. And once I found that out, I had to redirect. But I lost a lot of money in going in this direction, um, trying to do something with good intentions. But if I would have just waited, I would have got the part-time job that I have now instead of wasting the time and the resources. Um, all with good intentions, but um, if I would have been more patient, that patience, you know, I would have uh, not had to go through that struggle. That was my own fault. It was nobody else's but myself. Um, so delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you desires as you do that and then follow those desires. So with that being said, what do you actually need? What can help uh, new directions in getting resources to the prisons as well as um, yeah. doing getting done what you need to be done? Yeah, well, it's, it's a slow process getting into correctional facilities um, and getting doors open. So first it always is, I say pray. Prayer is the first stepping stone, and then we're going to act on what we pray about. So pray about it. Hey, do I feel drawn to do something with the correction facilities? And if you feel drawn to do something, then reach out to us, and we'll get you connected. We're always working with the correction facilities around Lansing. Um, there's 10 of them, and then we're slowly pressing into them um, and encouraging them to look for open doors of opportunities for our volunteers to go in there. Um, so if you feel like you have a desire to volunteer in the correction facilities, pray about it and then reach out if you feel like that is a desire on your heart. From there, um, Christian books and Bibles. Um, I just got a, did a big order of um, Bibles, um, but we always need like new, like newer material. We have a lot of people that donate old material and um, I'm thankful for it, but really it's, you know, it's a good newer material that we really need to get to the correction facilities. We send out a lot of books and, you know, they're so happy to see us when we go into correction facilities. They're happy to see the books. They're happy to see our faces when we walk in there. Um, I got a letter or new directions got a letter from somebody in a correction facility because this particular one didn't have no volunteers in there. And he wasn't asking for drugs. He wasn't asking for money. He was asking for Christian men to come into the facility and to do our best to get in there. And so I had someone write them back, let them know, you know, we're working on it, we're gonna get in there. But what an awesome thing that somebody's in a correction facility, been there for years, and his desire is to see Christians come in there and share the word. And it's the same way with books and Bibles. You know, there's guys in there that 
they can't buy all the materials, but we can send them to them for to read. Um, so if you have books or Bibles, newer, we'll say in the last 20 years, and they're like new, um, we're always in need of those to send to the facilities. We have a handful in the state, a handful out that we send to on a monthly basis. And then there's some sporadic throughout the year as well that we send books to in Bibles. And then resources, funding. It takes funding to accomplish this all. So, you know, financial support is always a blessing. You know, you hate to make the ask, but it's just the reality. Because from there, my big time goal is to help people when they get out. And I don't want to just help with words, but I want to help them financially, physically, and just walk with them. If they're taking a step of faith, I want to walk with them and help to provide for them. And that goes with some booklets to study. Nothing that's a burden, but just to encourage and um, some meals and just some quality time together. And so maybe if the mentor can't afford it, but New Directions can afford it and plan into both of them, it's well worth it. Um, so yeah, and then I know this sounds crazy. I've been the director for a year and a half, but my end game goal is a house for returning citizens. So you think about it, you're in the correction facilities. And I heard this, this is a true story. There's a guy in a correction facility, his name was his nickname was Zero, and he was in a correction facility. So he probably acted like a Zero before he went into prison. People called him Zero. Well, it, he went into the facility. He started attending Christian services. Over time, he changed his attitude. He started raising his hands and praising God, and then he accepted Jesus. And after one of the services, um, someone asked him how he got the name Zero, and he said because his friends always said he would never amount to much. His, he had a real name of, I'm just going to say Joe. It wasn't Joe, but his real name was Joe. And so now imagine Zero coming back to his home. Everyone's going to think of him as a Zero. And so how important is him to have a mentor, a disciple, someone to encourage him, or a house to go to, to keep him safe, to keep him grounded in the Word, so that he doesn't go back to acting like a Zero. Because he's not a Zero no more. He's a new creation in Christ. And um, so I want to have people there to walk with them. So a house is the end game goal. Um, so any extra finances that come in that is not needed to mentor and everything, it's just going um, into an account. As it continually grows, we're going to eventually purchase a place in Lansing um, to house a few men for a year so they have a foundation. I heard the illustration, and I'll stop with this illustration of, you know, they were in um, Egypt and they were slaves. And so that's kind of like zero at the beginning. And then he went into the wilderness. And so the wilderness, we could think of a house for him to live in for a year. It's preparing him to going into the promised land. And the promised land is when he steps out of this house um, into the promised land, whatever that looks like for him. So he continually delights himself in the Lord. He's going to give him desires, and then he's going to be able to know what direction to move. Um, so, yeah, support is always a blessing. It's going to go towards um, helping people out books and Bibles to be donated to the ministry, whether it be ones you've written or ones you've read. And then if you want to volunteer, um, we always are looking for more volunteer with that desire um, to do it once a month or every other month. Um, and um, God works it out, but it's a process and it takes time, as you know. It, it's not like, uh, I have a desire and I want to go in. It could take a few months to actually see the door open and get your foot in there. Yeah. So how can people get in touch with you? So you can go to newdirectionsministries.org. So that's newdirections, with an S, ministries.org. Um, or Justin W. at New Directions Ministries. We're on Facebook. Um, we're right here in Lansing. So, yeah, you just search that out online. You'll be able to find us. And um, I'll be more than happy to connect with you and see where we can go together. Well, that being said, thanks, Justin, for coming on and sharing your heart and you know, your love for ministry. and Yeah, I, I got to say thank you, Darnell, for, you know, your serving, your caring for the people in the facilities. And uh, you just got a heart for everybody. And so you're an awesome kingdom-minded person. And uh, that's what we need more of. So, yeah, you're a blessing to many. I appreciate hey, it. Brother, oh. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? With that being said, thank you all for tuning in. Be blessed. Peace.